Hello and welcome everyone. I'm John Smalley, a librarian with the San Francisco Public Library. Thank you for coming to our discussion of local and indigenous land practices. This panel marks the start of July's Everybody's Climate Program series, which we hope will inspire you to take action for a safer, greener, and more sustainable future. Before introducing you to our partners, I want to take a moment to acknowledge our community. On behalf of the San Francisco Public Library, we wish to welcome you to the unceded ancestral homeland of the Ramatush Ohlone, who are the original inhabitants of the San Francisco Peninsula. As the indigenous stewards of this land and in accordance with their traditions, the Ramatush have never ceded, lost, nor forgotten their responsibilities as caretakers of this place. As guests, we who reside in their traditional territory recognize that we benefit from living and working on their homeland. We wish to pay our respects by acknowledging the ancestors, elders, and relatives of the Ramatush community and by affirming their sovereign rights as First Peoples. Now, if you'd like to learn more about Everybody's Climate series, you can pick up a flyer from the back of the room or one of our newsletters, or you can go to our website and check the events calendar. The website is sfpl.org, or you can simply Google SFPL and Everybody's Climate. Today's program is a partnership with the Segorite Land Trust, an urban indigenous woman-led land trust based in Huichin territory that facilitates the return of indigenous land to indigenous people. The panel will be facilitated by two collaborators that we are honored to be working with, the Tongan poet and community organizer, Loa Niometolo, and Kim Shuck, San Francisco's seventh poet laureate. I'm now going to turn the microphone over to Kim and Loa. Please give a warm welcome to them. I have this terrible fondness for chewing the scenery, so I need the podium. I said I have this terrible fondness for chewing the scenery, so you'll forgive me for being at the podium. I'm going to read a poem. We're going to introduce people. They're going to speak. And Lo is going to finish it off with poetry. Um, welcome. This is called Hunting the Downtown. You know how the deer on Market Street are with their stoplight eyes, picking their way down old runoff paths past the disappearing relocated indigenous women. The ravens are here to sing us visible, drumming on their collection of upended pots and industrial buckets. Don't you tell me how we've changed. We were right there, near the department store, near the burial site, singing to ancestors. This isn't an abstract gesture. It's not a schoolroom exercise. There are predators here. And the maps of safe passage change every day, and the wind comes up in the afternoon. Don't you tell me how we've changed. The roots of this hill have learned what to call us just about, our clothes collected for the festival, our family members taken to who knows. You might just sit down and listen for a change. I'm not part of your curriculum. We're a whole other thing, light reflecting off miles of glass. How many feet deep was it? Can you hear the water like shattered windows, piled just like them, just there where the tall buildings lean like stealing? Thank you very much for that beautiful poem, Kim. And thank you so much, John, for having us in the San Francisco Public Library. Uh, Jose Tuhi relatives, I learned that from the indigenous people of this land. And that's, I guess that is also our greeting because we are settlers and guests on this land. So it's, it's a really great thing to learn. Um, well, I just want us to, uh, to sit, well, I guess I'm talking about myself. I'm just trying to get comfortable up here. Just Everyone just get comfortable up here. And so now Kim and I are gonna introduce um, our panelists. And I know a lot of you know who our panelists are. That's why you're here, to hear them. And they, it is exciting. It's a time in our lives where we have native leaders that we can 
show up and, and hear what they have to say. I think that's an amazing thing. I, I, it wasn't something that I always had growing up as an immigrant and settler kid when I was growing up in Utah when I first came to this country. So I, I think it's something, we're living in a historical moment, not only here in, in the Bay Area, but also I think around the world. But, but for me with the experiences of hap, you know, having seen, having, um, having the experience to be with indigenous leaders here where I live in the Bay Area, it's extremely significant and important in my life and learning more about my, myself, my spirituality, but especially about the land that I'm on and, and why that matters and how that helps me to heal in my family. So it's uh, with great honor that, well, first we're on, we're in San Francisco. We're on Ramatush land. We're in Yelamu, San Francisco, everybody. Oh. And so I would like to introduce to you Greg Castro, who is some, who, who's just a, a, a really wonderful person. But Greg is a leader with the Ramatush here. And um, so this is Greg right here. Sorry, Karina. So this is Greg right here. And you know, this, and this is the protocol for us to go through in our introductions. And Greg, it's, it's, it's been a, it's been a pleasure and an honor. To, it's been an honor first, you know, to, to get to know you and uh, different indigenous things that were that are happening around the bay. You're there. You're stepping up to your position. Um, I, uh, it's it's great to also know your partner Yolanda, and you have helped me in the different. Um, indigenous circles that uh, that are available and, and opportunities that have come up to learn more about Yelamu, to learn about the land, to learn about relationship, and to learn about the plants, like our relationship in Filoli. So it's and it's an honor for me to also hear you speak and to learn more from you, and to learn how it is to be a guest here on this land. And learning very much so with, with a lot of um, humility and, and um, funness that I'm also a relative on this land. So I come, I, where I live is across the bridge. And uh, I live in South Berkeley. And it's with, a gr with great honor and deep, deep respect that I introduce um, our next guest, Karina Gould. This is Karina. Just, I, don't know, I don't think anyone doesn't know that. But. You know, thank you. I'm so, I mean, uh, just to touch Karina, everyone, just is, is such an honor. You know, it just brings tears in, to my eyes, and I feel like my heart is, is deeply, just, just to be able to touch her, to sit by her. Karina, um, you know, I can't go on, I know, because of our time, but well, Karina is, is an intertribal leader of the Lishan Nation, which is the East Bay. Um, where we live, and perhaps some of you live. And she has, has been a leader for 30 plus years of saving the sacred sites of her people. And one of those sacred sites that Karina is able to lead us to bring everyone all kinds of, you know, um, beyond uh, borders and limitations, between, beyond race and religion and gender, she's brought all of us to help together, to work together to save the West Berkeley Shell Mound. And that is something that has been re the, our dear, beloved West Berkeley Shell Mound. It has become a land base for all of us. It's a land base for all of us. It's not just for the Lishan. It's a land base for all of us to support the Lishan as they continue to grow as an indigenous people of that land. But it's also a land base for all of us who don't have a home, who can't go back home, or who yearn for home every day. And Karina, thank you so much for making that happen for me and my family and my Pacific Islander community, and then for all of us here. Mahalo, Karina. Ofalahiatu. I have the great pleasure of introducing the other two panelists. But before I do that, I'm going to say that just in order to keep it tight, um, I just want to make the point, when you look at this stage, I have in my head the people that I would like to have on my survival team for the zombie apocalypse. <laughs> and many of, <laughs> many of them are, everyone on the stage is in that team as far as I'm concerned. I shared an office uh, briefly with, um, with uh, Melissa Nelson, who uh, 
Every time I spend time with her, I learn something new every time, including right before we came on stage. Uh, she's uh, a really good um, person to look to for inspiration when you have the need to remain gentle and kind, but also ferocious about protecting things and making things happen. Uh, and sitting next to me is uh, Tiny. Tiny is... Uh, there's not that many people that I, that I see on a pretty regular basis who literally save lives. And that is literally what Tiny does. And, uh, I, you know, I'm in awe of all of these people. Thank you so much for letting me be up on stage with you. Thank you so much, Kim. Yes, we're so proud of everyone up here, and we're so proud to be able to sit here with all of you. So let's just get to our first question. Um, this is, as John said, a climate change series. It, it, climate, everybody's climate is what it's called. Yeah, um, and so that's our first question, everyone. Um, how is it oh, that you um, talk, uh, teach, because a lot of you are educators here, uh, and work with climate change or about climate change? <laughs> oh, you're gonna pull that one. Oh, okay. All right, all right. In, in no particular order, I think one of the things that comes to mind right away is just sharing with people how long Native people have been saying this was happening and we were ignored for literally decades, generations. Uh, working and talking with people way up north, for instance, the, you know, Kuru, Yurok, Weot people up in the northern coast, they, they said their elders were talking about this three quarters of a century ago, how dramatically the environment was already changing. They could tell the subtleties um, and they were subtleties, but different kinds of subtleties, right? If you're talking about people who are enmeshed in their homelands, right? They are, they are the homeland. The homeland is them. They know every part of it. They know it intimately. So anything that changes, they, don't, they know it right away. And the changes they were seeing were radically different. It didn't often come into the sphere of their understanding of the world the way it should be. Right? Their, their original instructions didn't encompass those changes. And that's what started to, you know, the red flags went up, the, the red alerts, so to speak. And they've been saying many of these things for a very long time, and it was falling on deaf ears. So in some sense, when I, in, in the circles that I go into, you know, we, we talk about this all the time, but there's not a sense of panic <laughs> because we're sort of, you know, inured to it. You know, it's not that there shouldn't be panic. It's like, but we've been talking about this for three quarters of a century. You know, great that you guys are all catching up finally. Um, but we've been saying and trying to do it in our little bit way uh, in our homelands. But again, because it is global, the multiplying effect of indigenous people isn't having the desired effect on climate that, that it needs to. So, um, that's what's important about saying it's everybody's climate. We have everybody has to be on deck for this one, and um, it's far beyond what native people can do. We can certainly share knowledge, um, very valid knowledge for being here for you know, fifteen, twenty, whatever thousands of years on how the land and 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 humans can interact in a good way. Um, but time's running out, and um, the changes are so radical to our elders. To me, that's what's frightening. Not the climate. It's the how our elders and our culture bearers are reacting to it in a way. Because we go to them for, um, you know, strength, you know, and knowledge and confidence, right? And it, it's sometimes it's not there anymore because they don't understand it either. Now, now I'm now I'm scared. Can you answer that question too? 
Uh, okay. Yeah. I, I don't know if we have that much time. No. <laughs> <laughs> we have wonderful speakers here, and I'm just so happy to be um, on this stage with all of these amazing uh, folks that are, are present here. And I think that one of the interesting things is that uh, it, we're talking about climate change, and one of the things that I've talked about in my recent time since COVID is how when we as human beings sat down, the earth started to heal herself in a very short amount of time. That we all observed this when we were on this massive sit time, that the airs cleaned up as we sat down, the waterways opened up and um, our whales and dolphin relatives came home. Coyotes took over the streets here in Yalamu again. Um, and that we could see the impact very clearly of what human beings have done to this earth and that we uh, had a chance to change that. And we quickly went into this mode of going back to the same old grind and doing the same old thing and not making those changes that were made very clear to us. So when I talk about it and when I do the education about it, I talk about that story of that didn't happen a long time ago. It happened within the last few years. When I'm sitting on advisory committees for the Bay, uh, our waterway, and people are asking, how do we stop the water from coming up? How do we stop the salt water from going into our creeks and uh, affecting the waters that we drink? How do we begin to look at that when a small portion of what is going to get flooded in our territory is gonna cost multi-billion dollars to fix, and we're not just talking about um, you know, our territory, we're talking about the world. But when you take it down to the microcosm of a city and how much money it's gonna look like, and then it's our responsibility as indigenous people. Even though our territories may look like cities now with asphalts and buildings and concrete, it's still our responsibility it's what our, and I love to use this, our Hawaiian relatives use, it's our kuleana. It is what we are, our responsibility, our relationship to this land is our, our true selves are supposed to take care of this. And even though colonization happened here and the erasure was almost complete, it's still our responsibility. And so how do we ensure that as the water rises, that all of these factories and all of these uh, things that are on our coast along our bay are cleaned up before that water rises and destroys the bay even more than it already is? I remember as we begin to do this talking about teaching, it's like when, you, uh, when we were sustainable fishers, uh, fisher people, when we lived out of the bay, when we ate shellfish and fish out of the bay, that we could eat in abundance. And today in the bay, we're told that we are only supposed to eat the palm of our hand in terms of fish once a week. And that women and in childbearing years shouldn't even eat out of the bay at all. What have we done? And then I look at where we're at today. In terms of our colonization here in California, it's a shorter, much shorter period of time. It's only a few hundred years that we have destroyed the ecologies that are here. So that it is very simply an answer of going backwards in time to fix that. That we now have the, the uh, ability in science ways to actually reverse the things that we have done wrong. That we have to then be the voices for those that are voiceless that we have to begin to think about how do we bring our salmon home? And our salmon tells us these stories of, uh, of being in right relationship by doing their ancestral calling, that our salmon that we are attached to, that we have a relationship, that we live in reciprocity with, that not that long ago that there were diary entries written about salmon runs that would fill the entire Carquina Strait and that you could practically walk to the other side on their backs. And in my lifetime, I have not seen that, but it doesn't mean that we don't pray for those, aunt, those, those relatives to come home in abundance like that because they help our drinking water. They help us to be healthy. They feed everything along the way 
as they're trying to make their way home. And we see this now as we're watching the dams come down, as we're watching the waterways to become clear, as we're introducing wolves back into our, our ecology, that these are the kind of things that we have to make certain happen, that we can't just think of our comfort as we sat together during this heat wave that was early now. If we want to talk about climate disaster or climate change, that we're sitting in a heat wave that usually we don't get until September, October. And here we are at the very beginning of July, and we're seeing astronomical amounts of fires already happening in California. And what does that look like when human beings don't have their hands on the land anymore? When it was made uh, illegal for us to do those prescribed burnings or those cultural burnings that actually would have helped us to not have those. So when I do these, when we talk about teaching, it's about those things that we can take these little bits of information that we have and we can make different choices. And that's what we're hoping that we do as we begin to have these conversations, is to begin to have those conversations that allows us not to feel doom, but to actually feel like we can actually do something to change right now. I greet you all as relatives, and I'm just so honored to be here with these powerful leaders and comadres and brother and all um, the, the leaders here in so many different ways. So I'm really honored to be on your land here in Yalamu and be next to your territory. I was born in your territory. I've lived in your territory. Now I live up in Kosumiwak territory at the base of uh, Tamal Pais, the West Mountain. And so um, it's my responsibility as a mixed race native woman to honor the sovereignty of the first peoples of this land. So it's, it's really a treat to, to stand here with you. I think climate change is not a cause of our chaos. It is a result of our chaos. Um, climate change and uh, all the changes we're seeing, as Greg said, has been foretold by our ancestors, by our elders for s decades, or you could even say centuries, since Columbus first stumbled onto our sacred turtle island. So we knew that big changes would be coming, and Mother Earth is always changing to renew just like we are. And right now, the hurricanes hitting Jamaica and the fires up north and the flooding happening in other places, these are all ways that Mama Earth is trying to heal herself, rebalance herself from the exploitation and commodification that uh, capitalism and, and other forms of exploitation have been doing. Would you call capitalism? Crapitalism? <laughs> Crapitalism? Oh my God, we have some real amazing wordsmiths here. Uh, and so we know capitalism has been exploiting Mother Earth for, for centuries now, and it's time to rebalance. And so we need to get ready. And in fact, in many Native languages, our names for ourselves are those who get ready, those who are prepared, those who keep their eye open to the changes that are coming. And so there's a lot of changes coming. How are we going to prepare? How are we going to take care of each other, take care of the most marginalized? I think those are really important questions when we think about climate change. Scientists, of course, want to talk about nature-based solutions and the rights of nature and, you know, new forms of conservation. And they're going to keep coming up with all kinds of, you know, good ideas that are really late to the game and based so much on traditional ecological knowledge that, again, if they were listening to indigenous peoples from the get-go, we wouldn't be in this predicament. And so I think it's a very powerful and potent time we're in right now. We have this golden opportunity. We don't have much time, but we're in this golden opportunity to make some significant changes as a humanity, as culture. And, you know, 
Mother Nature is no doting mother. I mean, she will bring us to our knees, um, and we are going to have to beg for mercy and practice real humility and real open-mindedness and real learning. Um, I think, you know, we've gotten a little sleepy, um, and it's time to really wake up. So I see this as a potent time and an exciting time. Um, Karina and others, we were a part of this book um, that was uh, the title is a John Trudell quote, we are in the middle of forever. We are in the middle of forever. If you don't know it, um, indigenous voices on a changing earth. And we all share some really powerful and potent stories in that um, about this time. So how do we prepare? How do we get ready? I think Sigourite Land Trust has a, many excellent solutions with land rematriation, um, with the Shumi tax, with the Himetka um, centers for resilience for local communities. So I encourage you all to really think about that. How are you going to take care of each other? Because there will be more fires. There will be more floods. Um, there will be more diseases. And we also know here in San Francisco, there's shakes that happen also sometimes that can really shift and, and turn things upside down. So it makes me very grateful for the gift of life that we have and not taking any moment for granted. So I'll just end for that now. But thank you all for coming out to listen to um, this wonderful panel. Chi miigwech. Uh, I just want to second that um, I feel blessed to be with these warriors, all of y'all, um, and Mama Earth caregivers. Do you see us houseless mamas and daughters sleeping on those tents? That's a question, relatives. Do you see us houseless mamas and daughters sleeping in those tents? Yes. Yes. Right? That's because we don't got money for the rent. I want to sit with that for a second. When we talk about climate change, um, and even that, that words, the words are still way too simple, right? We're talking about Mama Earth. We're talking about um, the, the literally, the, the, the shrinking of Mama Earth and the sometimes expanding of our beautiful Mama Ocean or vice versa. Who's impacted first and worst? Poor people, indigenous people, but those of us houseless people who are closest to Mama Earth. I tell a story of when me and Ma were on the street back in occupied Tavangar, AKA so-called LA, and shout out to Etna Street Solidarity and reclaiming our homes and our relatives down there we're working with to, to build a homefulness. But we were down there getting swept. And um, it was an odd, you know, the, this concept of sweeping humans like we're trash, which is, a, I wanna deconstruct that hygienic metaphor for you right now. We're not trash, stop sweeping us. But at that time, right, me and Ma were actually sweeping our little area with a threadbare broom next to our tent. And then the police came and took our tent and threw it in the landfill, a perfectly good tent. Um, and all of our recyclables that we had carefully collected out of the corp rape recycling and trash corporations that make money off the production of landfill and so-called recycling and half the time it never really is recycled. So I want to lift up that the work that we as houseless people and poor people do and to the original beautiful question by Loa about so-called climate change about mama earth is that we take care of her all the time and that we're in that Right, we're in that close relationship. I don't know if we're always in right relationship as Karina talked about, partly because when we become in our communities or communities outside, as I often say, they are destroyed. Uh, the violence of sweeping humans like we're trash is an act of destruction and desecration. And don't get it twisted, relatives. You might not want to look at us, as I often say in my opening poem, I'm that poverty scholar, that houseless mama, that houseless daughter, all those people they don't want to see, never want to be, look away from we. What you going to do, Oakland, Berkeley, Frisco, L.A., arrest we? We're in your shitty. But they may not want to look at us, but the reality is 
that we are in these communities and we're actually trying to thrive. And in so many communities like Wood Street Common, shout out to our relatives at Wood Street, shout out to Camp Resolution in occupied Nisinan, Maidan, Maidu territory. In so many of these communities, when we build humble communities that do the very thing that Melissa and Greg and Karina are talking about is, you know, getting smaller, getting humble, taking care of, living with less, we are destroyed because we are not seen as humans. And therefore, our decisions and our walks on Mama Earth are not validated as, as liberation. So we work with so-called climate change every day, as some of you may know, uh, us poor and houseless people and, and indigenous relatives and with spiritual guidance from Segorite and Karina and Deja and so many others are unselling Mama Earth in occupied Uchun right now so that we can liberate her, so that we can take care of her and so more importantly than anything else that we can give her back to the community and the plants and the four-leggeds and the winged ones. Um, I'm most concerned and I want to shout out that we lost two relatives from climate change, AKA climate terrorism, as Klee Benali Ibaye would say. Um, today, from heat exhaustion, 110 degrees in so-called Sacramento. Um, yeah, we're going to perish as those of us outside are the closest and the most immediately impacted. Um, I want to shout out to our relatives in the so-called Pacific Northwest. We're also trying to lift up for our homefulness up there. But a lot of us live along the creek beds when we're outside. And same with Maidu territory. And when the creeks rise, we die oftentimes. I want to lift that up because we're pushed further and further outside. So there's a lot more that I could say, but I just want to lift up that we come in from the outside today to lift up so that you can see us and not look away. Thank you all of you for those really thoughtful answers. Um, in um, the Cherokee language, we have a word, gadugi, which is community, which implies more reciprocity than that. And it doesn't just include people, it includes everything in the environment. That we live in community with one another, that we have a responsibility to one another. And because I know that um, everyone works with youth in, on the land on this panel, I wanted to ask you what has been your experience with that, with bringing children and youth from cities who might not have that experience to the land. Again? <laughs> Um, yeah, habit. <laughs> um, we have a similar word in my father's Salinan language south of the Ohlone. Tate uh, Tamilot uh, is what it is. And when linguists do their linguistic thing, you know, they go, oh, that means family. But they don't know what family really means to us. And it's just like Kim said, it's the place we're at, the landscape. The landscape's alive. The trees, the rocks, and birds, yes, those alive, but the land itself is alive. It's a relative, and it's part of us. Our st origin stories say, tell us where we came from and often from parts of the land, like my dad's people are made of elderberry, which grows at the base of our sacred mountain where we came into the world. And I think it's important that um, as over to the times I've been doing this for over 30 years that I, I believe Native people have become better at articulating how we really view the world. For much of the time and still we're reactive, right? The world scientists, anthropologists, whoever now climate Calamity people will come to us and ask us specific questions. So we respond to that question in a certain way. They don't just come and ask, well, what do you think? 
right? With our youth, I think we have this opportunity to flip that, to tell them the deeper meaning of how we view the world. So one of the ways that I try to do it is explain the terminology we use and how sometimes it doesn't fit, right? So, for instance, we often use, and I think we may have used it here, we're saving the earth. We're saving Mother Nature. We are doing no such thing. That ain't happening. We're saving ourselves. Earth, Mother Earth can take care of herself and has shown it multiple times in the past. Right? And I think as toddlers in the sandbox, we have this idea that we can manipulate the adults around us, particularly our parents. Right? And, and that we, you know, they, we cry and they come running. Um, you know, we, we move our lips and, oh, you're hungry. Okay. And they respond. Right? That's not control, though. That's care. Mother Earth cares for us. Through Mother Earth, we learned the original instructions about how to take care of her in a way that sustains us, not her. That's a way different way of thinking of things. And it took me a long time for elders to like whack it into my brain. And part of the problem is English. English itself, because it, it's so objectifying of things, commodifying of things, separating of things. The interrelationship between things isn't well accommodated with English. The, the concept of tate tamilo takes two paragraphs to really properly explain in English. So I think what's important is getting our youths back with their hands in the dirt. And while they're in, it's, their in, hands are in the dirt, their toes are in the dirt, you tell them the stories, the origin stories, how we came into the world. And sometimes we have to do it in English, but we have to nuance them with our deeper understanding of our ancient philosophy, culture, interaction with the world. Is that going to make a difference? Too soon to know. For me, maybe I'm a pessimist, but it also is irrelevant because it's the right thing to do. It doesn't matter what it accomplishes other than it's the right thing to do. The outcome will take care of itself. Oh, all right, we'll do it the same way. All right, thank you, Greg. You know, I think that, uh, that okay, that's a really good question. I love this question, actually, better than the first question. Um, you know, I want to say that also, you know, um, Melissa is an academic and has written a lot of stuff that I think you all should re read. And she was also the executive director of the Cultural Conservancy for like 30 years. Um, and has worked with indigenous people all over the world um, to really look at how our lives have been impacted by colonization and how it is now looking at the world through this lens of climate disaster. And so, um, so thank you for that work, Melissa. You know, she also sits on the board of the Segorite Land Trust, and she's our oh. uh, chair. And so I really appreciate her being here with us to talk about the, the work with us in that kind of way. And my friend Greg here, who is my brother uh, from across the way, you know, it took, Loa and I uh, came over in my little uh, white Thule boat today, um, <laughs> which is a Prius, and it took us forever to get here. And so for me, it's like over the last few years, I've decided not to take a lot of talks in San Francisco because of the imprint that it makes on the earth just to come across the bridge, right? To sit in traffic. And what does that do for us? And I really like that the world figured out how to do Zoom and that we could talk to each other all over the world and we don't have to be in the same room, and we don't have to jump on a plane, and we don't have to get in our cars. 
makes it a little difficult sometimes when people want to see you in person. But it, it often makes me think about what are we doing if we're not making those conscious decisions, right? And I also want to talk about, you know, my friend Tiny, who I have known since we took over Segorite, and she showed up and prayed with us at that fire on our waterway that we were protecting uh, about 13 years ago. You know that this is a relationality that we have, that we see each other in all the time. So how does it answer the question, right? Because I can get long-winded and I need to shut up. But when I started, Segorite started as the first urban indigenous women-led land trust for a reason, as we have been praying for our ancestors to come home from these institutions that were hoarding them away, like they hoard so many indigenous peoples things as they call them. It's our cultural patrimony. It's our, our, our who we are as human beings, right? But they hoard away our ancestors. And in these places, we had been praying and stopping along the way as we prayed on these long journeys walks. And we walked with people from all over the world and people from all over here. And my good friend Mishwa is here in the audience today and she walked with us during those walks. And we walked from the village of Segorite, which is in Vallejo along the Carquina Strait. And we walked down to San Jose and up to San Francisco, a 300 mile journey that our ancestors had walked for thousands of years. In our mindsets, the way we're taught about it, we're taught about that we were these stagnant people that sat in this one area and never moved. Human beings have always moved. And so we were able to go and to be at those places and we took young people along with us. And my children came with us on those walks and they remembered what those were, walks were like. And my daughter and our, her good friend, Victoria, who works for the Segorite Land Trust as well, brought back a walk over the last two years, walking from Shell Mound to Shell Mound, walking from Berkeley to Emeryville, which is only a three mile walk between those village sites. But it also recalls those steps that our ancestors had for thousands of years, right? Segorite Land Trust has this opportunity to bring people along with us. And young people are who we need to bring along with us. And I really like the way my brother talked about having the young people with their hands and their toes in the soil, because that's how we grew up. We grew up getting pushed outside to play. Kids today don't do that, and I see that in my grandchildren, right? In, especially during, since COVID, that they're in front of these screens way too often. But this last weekend, my daughters and my grandchildren took a journey up north to Kashaya territory, and they gathered seaweed, and they learned how, what that was like to do that for the first time in a couple of hundred years that that's what you have to do, right? How do we do that in reciprocity? How do we begin to do that in building those relationships with other indigenous people to do that? The weekend before we had a tribal gathering and the first piece of land that we've had with the city was actually with the city of Richmond and we created a park together. And believe it or not, we actually were able to figure out which plants we wanted to grow in that particular place before we had the land trust. We were unable to go and gather without permission anywhere. We couldn't gather our own traditional foods or medicines or any of those kinds of things without asking permission from private landowners or parks. And that this particular city of Richmond allowed us to figure out how to grow the things we wanted. And then we brought tribal members in and they got to gather sage and mugwort, and they were able to um, do angelica root. And we are the only ones that can actually gather there, mm -hmm. right? Yerba buena and other things that we're growing our traditional foods. My granddaughter can now walk into one of the lands and they can pick flowers that she knows she can eat because she's been going to the land since she was a baby. Mm -hmm. That she can tell us what those plants are for that we were able to do that, that there is a, a change in it. It didn't take that long. It didn't take generations, right? But these kids know more than I do. 
and that's a beautiful thing. Young people who grew up in urban areas that never had access to land are able to learn how to grow indigenous plants and which ones grow well together and to experiment with it without having to be told that that's not how you do it, but to actually build a relationship with the lands that they're on, to understand that reciprocity, to be able to lay down on the land, to create a, response, a, a, a relationship with trees that you're planting, to grow foods and to learn how to process them again like our ancestors had. But that's a, a blessing to bring in adults, elders that learn, that know everything that they know about Thule and have them share that with us to create our first Thule boat in 200 years and to watch our children and grandchildren go on the waterways again. That is what happened. We're not talking about this took 10 years. It just took a few years and people's willingness to say, to say yes. And so when I look at our young people and how do we encourage them, that's how we encourage them every single day to be out there, to be a part of the landscape that has always been their home, to remember and to remind people that have come here that have no access to land, that have made this their home, that they can also build here as long as they live in reciprocity with that land and water and air and create a relationship with fire that has been non-existent for decades. Wow, I've got to follow our chief here. That's a tough one. Karina, that was so beautiful, so beautiful. I've been really honored to be a uh, ally, comrade, accomplice with the Ohlone and other California native tribes and nations with gathering Thule and opening up access to Thule um, for creating mats and boats and baskets and toys and so many beautiful things made from that gorgeous plant Thule. And I was also lucky to teach American Indian Studies at San Francisco State uh, for 18 years with our College of Ethnic Studies. And um, so an incredible group of multi-ethnic young people, urban kids, often, you know, first time to college, English is a second language often. And, uh, but grown up totally in urban landscapes and we would get out to Indian Canyon, an Ohlone landscape uh, down south in San Benito County, um, a safe refuge for the, the mission Indians to escape to back in the 1700s, 1800s, unconquered land. And uh, there was no cell service there. Is there still no cell service there? And actually about halfway through the drive from, from Gilroy to there, cell service got dicey. And the students would be like, da, 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 da. Ah. and I would say, just relax. It's OK. You know, they have a landline. I don't know if you know what that is. But you know, <laughs> there, there's this thing. If you need to make a call, we can make a call. And there would literally be like, 45 minutes of real anxiety. And we'd get out, and Anne Marie and Kenny would always welcome us, and we'd do a welcome ceremony and song. So that kind of calmed people down, have a drink of water. But it was palpable the anxiety and frustration of these young folks who could not get on their phones. But we'd, you know, go for a walk and start to move the energy, and, you know, in about 30, 45 minutes, each, each young person was different, of course, but all of a sudden they're like, is that an oak tree? <laughs> Are those acorns? Wait a minute, what's that? Oh my God, look at, there's a lot of traditional structures there. It's like, that's a Thule Lodge? Wow, that's what, you know, the Ohlone ancestors lived in? Oh my God, and then there was all these medicine plants, and then we'd eat thimbleberries if we were in season and go see a waterfall, and I mean, within then another 20 minutes, they, their eyes were so wide open. 
it was just such an, a gratifying experience. You know, I really felt like I did nothing except drive the car and give them directions and just give the space, a safe space to be in a healthy, natural landscape, in a native landscape, in a sovereign landscape, to just be and, and not have to do all the time. And so, um, of course, we then had instruction about how to weave with the tule and how to gather the acorn and the cultural burning and the manzanita and the different plant uses. And it just is so gratifying. And, um, you know, our, our dominant Western culture has become so uh, eco-illiterate eco-illiterate. And I loved a word I learned from Chuck, uh, Chuck, Kim Chuck, right before this, this presentation where she talked about um, tactile vocabulary. I love that. And I would love for you to say more about that. But as um, young people are on these machines all the time, losing sight, losing, able to listen, and losing the ability to feel different textures and work with different plants. So it's so important to, to get young folks out to keep doing that. And it, it ain't that hard. We got urban parks. We have rematriated land. We have sites. We're so blessed to live where we do in the Bay Area. There's mountains and oceans and places all over. Um, so I love encouraging young folks and all people to get out there and really unplug and feel feel the healing power of the earth in, in bringing us back to ourselves. So, um, yeah, yeah, that's how I say it. Help. Um, well, let's see. <laughs> There's so many things. I want to start by saying that I'm a concrete jungle survivor. Um, and I'm, I've just, I say this, I talk, about myself because I say that, you know, the revolution is not about I, uh, it's not about me, my pronoun is we. Um, so I'm talking in, in collaboration with my fellow street survivors. Um, but I wanna say that I'm also the daughter, um, the melanin challenged daughter of a strong Afro-Taino mama who barely survived foster homes, she called them torture homes and was ripped away from anything that was connected to culture and was another concrete jungle survivor. So when I hear the generations, when I hold the generations of trauma of being separated from our mama ocean and our mama, our mama earth, um, I, in many ways I feel like, you know, definitely PTSD war victim all the time, walking and trying to keep on keeping on, like so many of our relatives, uh, my fellow relatives on the street. I bring that up because at 11 years old um, and throughout all my childhood, I was living in, in Tavangar, LA and, and up here, Oakland, Berkeley, Frisco, you know, and just barely holding on. I did never had the privilege of putting my toes in any kind of earth. I never even understood what planting was. And, and, and I'm just hearing these words that Greg said and Karina said and Melissa and just holding them in my heart and recognizing the brokenness that comes from the disconnection and the dislocation of all of us in this capitalist, violent, extra extractive system that it just takes and takes from Mama Earth every day and Mama Ocean and the, the sky and the moon and all of our elements, right? And I just want to sit with that as, as, I, as I invite you into the trauma of relatives like myself who you see or maybe don't see uh, on these streets. Um, I also want to say that the medicine that we have built as houseless and poor and in pan-indigenous people is homefulness, a homeless people's solution to homelessness that right now has 21 relatives who used to be on the street living in it, uh, and two of them are babies, <laughs> uh, babies. Um, who were formerly at Wood Street, uh, on the street, surviving in, in you know, car, on in a tent. Um, but I also want to talk about another baby who was born in the porta potty at homefulness, who was born to a ma who was not in a position to hold that baby and hold her. But that baby was not going to be stopped. That baby was going to live. 
and as a com community of poor and houseless people. And I want to shout out to my beautiful brother Israel is in the audience and Maya uh, and my son Tivu, who I'll talk about in a second, <laughs> uh, who's got that phone in his other hand while he's insta-scamming the event. Anyway, uh, I do that all the time. That's what we do as mamas. Anyway, I want to say that that other baby was going to live no matter what in our community of poor and houseless people was able to get that baby out of that porta potty that they had landed in the you know what right in the shit um, and no mother was harmed in that process and nobody was incarcerated or charged with criminal negligence which this system would do but rather that baby was safe and I, I bring all of that up to lead us into the vision that is Decolonize Academy, uh, where I have the blessing of, uh, of helping to teach uh, the very granddaughter that Karina talked about. Shout out to beautiful Anaya, we love you, and, and, uh, and all the warriors, Kai and Shane and Donnie and Avery, and, and also uh, and, uh, Amir and Zaire and so many more, and my son. And I want to say that Coming back to Tibu to my son, um, a couple weeks ago, well, first of all, at Decolonize Academy, we, we teach back the stolen histories and herstories. Um, we make sure that permaculture and gardening, shout out to Mutiado Silencio, who's there, my warrior brother in this movement. Um, we make sure that that's an integral part of curriculum, that a whole day of learning is in relationship with growing and planting and taking care of Mama Earth. Um, these are privileges that I see, honestly, and they really shouldn't be seen as privileges, but for concrete jungle survivors, they are privileges. Um, and I wanna say that, you know, we do many more things and, and you know, have beautiful teachers like Loa and Karina and Deja and others teaching back indigenous languages and also just regular capitalist, crucial math and all that other stuff we have to know. But what I wanna lift up about my son is that he was taught that, he's a graduate of Decolonize Academy, our first graduating class right in the middle of the pandemic, 2020, four uh, young warrior poverty scholars. Last week, he started a garden on his own with Mama Roselia, an elder, an elder Purapecha doctor, as we call her, a uh, resident, Mutiado's mama, started a garden because he knew that that was what he should do. Nobody told him to, it wasn't required, but that he was able to do that and he was able even to think that that was something that he should do. And yeah, we're in constant conflict, conflict with those machines that I might add also kill babies in the Congo. And I'm really working myself to get rid of, to put away, and I haven't gotten very far. We're all addicted to Insta scam and phase crack, and, and there's so much work we have to do as humans, as my sister Queen Nandi would say, to get off of these Insta scam and these, and these social machines before they are inside of us. But I want to say that even with that, our young people have been able to lift up the medicine from Mama Earth. I also want to say that our elders are extremely important in that and that without the teachings of Mama Roselia, who teaches the yerbas and how to heal our bodies from those plant medicines, if we didn't have the medicine of Karina and we didn't have the medicine of Loa, we wouldn't be able to decolonize our minds from this lie that we only belong on concrete. And so I just want to lift up that this is a struggle we're traumatized and poor people who are constantly in conflict with our own minds and hearts and in so much trauma, but we will not give this up and we say humbly that we need to homefulness the world because rent is a lie and this system of buying and selling Mama Earth is a capitalist scheme to destroy us all. Oh, oh my dear. Thank you so much, Tiny. Um, I think we're gonna have a last question because we're at 5.09 and we've been told that we have to end at 5.30 because the library is closing. So I just also want all of us panelists to 
to, we have the clock up there, but you know, this, this next question I'm going to ask you, and also Tiny, I see your, I see your poetry uh, peeping out of your bag, wants, wants to like, you know, wants to be shared. So also I'll, I'll like to leave that last poem for you. So, you know, we could end it around, you know, enough time for that, for Tiny to close us out. Um, this next question I want to ask is, I am very honored to be in this, in this uh, panel. I, I do go to a lot of, I am asked to, to attend a lot of climate change panels because I'm a Pacific Islander and um, you know, our, our seas are really ri rising and um, you know, a lot of destruction is happening in, in the, where we're from, the pito, the belly button of the Pacific. And, uh, so I, just sitting here in this panel in this very short amount of time, I see that we that y'all just got to the root, the root of what it is that they call climate change. And I've, I see in the panels that they always talk about things like uh, carbon um, credits, uh, always talking about, you know, coal or um, what, what fossil fuels and with, with these kinds of these kinds of conversations. But sitting here in front of you, I really see that you're, ta you're talking about the roots, the roots of taking care of Mama Earth, the roots, you know, that, that um, yeah, um, Kilmerer, the, the author with Braiding Sweetgrass, talks about, and you, you all said it, that it's, it's about loving the land and loving the earth. So with these last minutes, I would like to ask you, it's a personal question, and all these were, you know, I want to ask you, what, what is a, can you share with us a story about a time, a moment, like in your work as, as leaders, as educators, as land stewards, as warriors, what was a time, and you know, Tiny just talked about being from the urban jungle, even myself having grown up in the Pacific um, Islands and then, you know, in the land, in the ocean, and, and yet coming and living in apartment buildings, you know, not having access to land um, and living in a, and, and becoming poor in this capitalist society. So, you know, I also didn't have access to land until it happened. And that was a really important time in my life. And I do feel because of that and how I honor that, I, I do want to, you know, I, it's okay. I feel I have a place to talk about that relationship. So, so if you, you know, each one of you can please share that with us. I think that's so vital for us to hear today. Um, that a story about when you, first of all, I want to just laugh at you, how you asked me that. <laughs> a very short God, story. I thought it was very eloquent, you know. <laughs> it just, it's <laughs> An extremely short story. <laughs> Uh, let me take a shot. <laughs> um, I, I grew up in San Jose. My parents, uh, both native, uh, mother Loni uh, Rumson and Ramatush, my father Slynn in south of the Loni, and uh, my father grew up in the homeland in a very rural part. I mean, my, in places where my ancestors from 5,000 years ago who would, might still recognize it. That's amazing considering the urbanization we have here in the San Francisco Bay Area. I grew up in San Jose after he served in World War II. That's where the growth of civilization was going, heading towards the urban areas, so he moved to San Jose. But I grew up in an orchard, and I worked those orchards uh, along with my brothers and my mom uh, in the early days. And it wasn't until the 70s when, when I was almost in high school where it all, almost overnight was paved over and uh, became Silicon Valley, <laughs> which I wound up working w within for almost 50 years. But the, but the gift I got from my father in specifically was his attachment to his homeland, the places uh, that he grew up uh, in the San Lucia Mountains. Uh, even though he didn't spend that long there, it was by far the f most overwhelming influence in his life. It was the only place he ever, that I ever saw him be himself. Mm -hmm. We would go back often um, to hunt, to fish, to sit under trees, to sit and look at the mountain where our people say we came into the world, where the elderberry became us. And I can still do that now. 
And so that's an incredible gift that really grounded me. So even though as I grew up in the orchard I grew up in went away, uh, my connection did not. And I was able to share that uh, with my children and grandchildren. And I'll end, because uh, we're in short time, um, the transition from that, from my father who grew up in the homeland, but it, by that time, uh, your American civilization had ripped away most of the culture. There were very few speakers left. In my mom's uh, Rumson uh, homeland, there was none by that time. And since then, you know, my, my own children were teenagers when I was part of the group that brought back our rituals and our ceremonies and our songs and our dances. My grandchildren have never lived in a time when they haven't heard their songs. I sang each of them a welcoming song into the world the day they were born. So that's, if, if you want to call that hope, that's, that works for me. Okay, I still don't know what the question is, but I'm going to ask. <laughs> I'm going to give Law a hard time the whole night. Um, but I think that, you know, when we're, I just have to say, so today is my baby brother's birthday. And he passed away uh, two years ago in March. He was the last of my original family. And, um, and so it's, uh, so I have to just shout out him today, right? Oh. But I also have to remember growing up in these concrete jungles and we all did that, right? And so uh, Hu Chun the village site of my ancestors, who where we where we live right uh, today in the East Bay, um, was a was this place that had so much water, right? There was creeks and tributaries that just came off of the off of the hills, and it was lush, and um, and everything's culverted. You don't see creeks in San Francisco, really, right? You know, same thing in Oakland. There's little bits and pieces of it. And in those culverted tunnels, my brothers grew up running through them, right? And so there was that connection in this weird kind of way that as I'm remembering uh, my brothers doing that, right, that they still had that connection to being close to those waterways, even though we were in this concrete jungle. And that they knew them really uh, intimately and the reason that they knew them very intimately is because most of the times as teenagers, they were running from the police, right? And you can laugh about that because I do, right? <laughs> but it's also this way that the earth um, continues to take care of us even though we cover her up with concrete and asphalt and buildings. And today when I sit here and I listen to the stories of my sisters and my brother here, it reminds me of this, uh, of a time that wasn't so long ago when human beings lived whatever outside is, outside, right? And that the first sweep that they did was indigenous people. Mm -hmm. And that there's that connection here that we have to continuously tell ourselves that we're not that far away from where we had started from. And that um, every day that I'm able to um, be blessed to um, be a part of this land that my ancestors have always, they placed me here, right? They placed us here for a particular reason, right? Not just the, not, not just, you know, Greg and I, you know, here, but all of you too. That there's a particular reason why you're here in our territories right now that there is a reason for you to be a part of the solution, a part of how do we live in this reciprocity again. And that is something that's really what we try to envision at Segorite, is that there is a reason for us to all be here today. Sometimes when I talk to young people there and I tell them the story, you know, that they're Human beings got themselves outside of the creation circle, and we, we made a mess of it, just like the younger brothers and sisters often make a mess out of things, right? But we can come back into that circle, right? We can stop making that mess. We can remember what our responsibility is. We were the last ones that were created. Everything else was created before us, and nothing on this earth that was created before us needs us in order to survive. Mm -hmm. 
but we need everything that was here created before us in order to be here. So we have to humble ourselves and to remember that, that this water is not infinite, that the air that is clean is not infinite, that the soil that we grow foods and medicine on are not infinite, right? Because their extraction that's happening, the minerals that are being taken out, the foods that we eat are not as healthy as they were as when we were kids. That we have to remember that we as human beings may be made a mistake, and it may not have been just us, me, myself, right? But human beings as a people did that. And, but we have the ability to fix it, and we have to fix it quickly. And so just remembering my little brother and running through those creeks and dreaming of opening up our creeks again mm -hmm. so that our children oh. and our grandchildren can play in them together. Right. Oh. Oh. I love the earth and the earth loves me because I'm the great granddaughter of buffalo hunters. I am the daughter of boarding school survivors. I am the daughter of relocated urban mixed race women and children. I'm the descendant of Sky Woman. I am related to the turtle, and I'm so honored to dance on Turtle's back every single day by walking Mother Earth, breathing the beautiful air from the birds, tasting the sweet waters and the salty waters. I am a guest in the salmon nation, guest in the salmon forests, guest of abalone woman on the ocean, shining brightly on us every day. Miigwech. See, there's a price on my head because I don't got money for a roof or a bed. I want to lift up that... Um, that it was mama's dream when we were on the street, sleeping in car, backseat of hoopties, uh, doorways, shelter beds, bus shelters, and sometimes a motel or a squatted apartment if we're lucky enough to get one. It was mama's dream to have come unity and to actually build interdependence and resist the capitalist, colonialist lie of independence I want to shout out that Poverty Scholar Warriors, Indigenous Warriors, like Karina's brother, uh, there's so many of our relatives on the street who are from the first peoples of this land. Um, I want to shout out, I don't know if uh, Stop the Sweeps Seattle is in the house, but um, our relatives up in, uh, you know, so-called Bellingham, Olympia, all of these Pacific Northwest locations, um, 60% of the relatives are Lumi and Nooksack and um, many of the other Duwamish and many of the relatives, that is the houseless people of those, those territories. And so I want to just recognize the connections there. And I want to go back to mama and I want to say that it was mama's dream when we had nothing and when we were ground down to nothing by societal hate that we would lift up a solution created by us, for us, and for everyone else. Um, but, you know, Poor Magazine is in fact po. We need your dough. Um, we don't do this without radical redistribution of, of uh, conscious wealth hoarders radically redistributing more than they might have. And, and I, I know that that's not directly to Loa's question, but I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm spitting some game here because I'm in a crisis because we're losing up to six to 10 people every day from the violence, and that's what it is, the violence of homelessness. I so much gratitude and love for my sister Karina for lifting up the connection of the colonial desecration and removal in the 21st century to the before Gregorian time, right? The colonial connections there. And shouting out to our brothers and sisters in Palestine and Sudan and Kanaki and West Papua and to Kashmir and all of the other places and spaces in Mama Earth that are dealing with this same lie that Mama Earth is for sale. As I often say, Mama Earth is not for sale. We know that she is, that she's been traded on the commodities market. 
but that we can take her off the market collectively. And to all the land liberators and the warriors in this room, these are, these are personal responsibilities. These are personal steps that we can take. And so when I lift up the concept of community reparations and radical redistribution, that puts back the reciprocity into our collective reality. We don't need to look for the philanthropists and the, and the banksters. We don't need to look for you know, the government gangsters. We have it within our communities and within our own hearts. And so inviting you all to the next session of People School and also saying that my mama should still be here, but poverty and homelessness kills. And there's more people than I could even begin to tell you who should still be in our community, but are not. And a shout out to my brother, Levar Moore, and, and other warriors who helped create homefulness, a rent-free forever housing. Mama Earth and Mama D has a home. And there wouldn't be a her. There wouldn't be a me without her. Oh, oh, Mateo. Oh. I'd like to thank everybody on this panel for being here. Um, Greg and Karina and Melissa and Tiny for sharing things. And I'd like to point out, I'd also like to thank the AV department who always treat us really well. Kenny, who I can't see right now, and Mike, who's right there. And the library for holding these kinds of events. Thank you. Thank you, John Smalley, for holding up your end of this. It's really great. I'm going to point something out. Listening's a responsibility and part of the reciprocity, but it's really not all of it. So if this is important to you, important enough to show up on a Sunday afternoon, mm -hmm. pick a thing and do it. Mm -hmm. Thank you all for being here. Oh. oh. watching the air quality index soar to the roof. I must remind all of you living in places so you can shelter in safely of so many of us still outside, evicted behind the lie of rent, the myth of success, the hoarding of stolen mama earth and all those real snake papers and payments, hiding in doorways, car seats, bus benches without a place away from your sheltered eyes while Mama Earth fires rage outside and you close your windows and doors, heeding the warnings of shelter in place for sure, so many of us can barely breathe, no longer having the privilege of sheltered safe space to see. In the colonial terror launched centuries ago, poor people made poor by colonial theft and the lie of ownership, Continue to slip in and out of your fake lie called non-profiteering and business improvement districts. The privilege of breathing. Shelter beds and vouchers, saviors and charity complex. Black and brown polite terror leading to black and brown polite murder. And then, and then there is the lie of rent. And once again, we are all left to ask, how do you shelter in place when you have no place, how do you house, how do house people, politricsters contribute to practice the violent act of looking away? I don't want your pity. I don't want your crumbs. I want to close a door, shut a window, and share the privilege of breathing and one more day to come. <laughs>